Right, guys, I know we've left you pretty deprived for a couple of weeks, so we thought it was time for another episode. Our guest today doesn't need much of an introduction for you Kiwis that still listen to us. He's a bit of a laugh and one of our favourite sports journalists and broadcasters, and he's got a bloody knowledgeable sports head on his shoulders. You guys know him from The Crowd Goes Wild, The Alternative Commentary Collective, and a few other bits and pieces. Welcome back to the Social Distance Podcast today with James McConey. Yep, we are. Recording started. All right, mate. Here we are. This is our podcast. <laughs> they don't want to be locked into a, a house or an apartment or some space. Got to follow the social distancing rule. More social distancing keeps more people healthy. It's like, oh, you guys are good at talking shit. Why don't you just do a podcast? As soon as you try to do a podcast, we sound like a bunch of Muppets. James. Bloody good to have you here, mate. How's it Sorry. going, lads? Good to see you. Am I um, I'm appearing? Well, how do I lose weight on a podcast? It's really hard. It adds uh, about 10 pounds to your podcast. I'm yeah, never going to be interviewed by cyclists again. This is a total <laughs> stitch up. Especially when you've got the skinniest one in New Zealand on the left there. Now, you know the complex my girlfriend has. She's like super lean, but she just has this like, it must be terrible dating a cyclist. <laughs> I know. I've been out there cycling and I tell you what, the, the skinny ones do go faster. I must admit. Oh, there's no doubt about that. Except for the downhills. I always get George there. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm offering a lot on the downhill uh, run. Um, probably not much on the light crest stakes, but it was it's always awkward, isn't it, um, interviewing a cyclist when you see what sort of light crest they're asked to wear. Mm. You know, quite a lot. <laughs> you can tell they're not too happy with the all white sort of thing. Oh, the, the problems love the all whites. Um, what about Tony Marta? We had, a teammate of mine famously had a all white skin suit that, um, and he <laughs> he had a sandpaper on his saddle as a grip, and they did an hour like he was a world champion at the time, so it was you know he always has white shorts and everything, and then you could just see as it wore through this horrific long time trial, <laughs> as it suddenly turned red, <laughs> seeping down oh. to the white. <laughs> Oh man, a bit of saddle soreness. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I actually put one of those, you know, like the the rather than having to sort of always get into the light crew and wash everything and all that sort of stuff. Because I know you go undieless, right? No undies. Yeah, don't run undies. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, well, no. Instead, I'm just going to buy the saddle cover thing. That's a little bit, you know, <laughs> it does the job. It's good. Like on the old urban commuters. Yeah, yeah. I'm like a commuter. Really. But then, what are you running on top? And what are you run? What shorts are you running? Um, just a normal kind of like um, cargo pants. <laughs> yeah, pretty much the cargo pants because I like multiple pockets. You know, mm. keep a Kit Kat on one, and then uh, you know, a Morrow Miles bar on the other. other. Well, yeah. there's something you can get like the like the enduro pants. Are essentially, a, a, a boarding short so you don't look like one of us, which is fully understandable. And then, but you have an inbuilt chamois, so you can and then you can just clip it out and wash that. Might be something to look into. Um, yeah, that's good advice. But yeah, no, no, I think, I mean, I, I've got no problem wearing the Lycra, and it's actually quite freeing when you first go undieless. I think I did that for the round uh, Topor. Um, I only did a quarter of it, um, but it was, it was still quite a big hill, but it's it's actually quite nice. I listened to the test cricket while I was um, cycling, but I don't know. They say you're not really allowed to listen on your earbuds, but is that a rule or is that the law? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I do it. I don't yeah. think you do it, George. I do it in training every, all the time, but in a race, you can't do it. Well, I've made a couple of exceptions before, actually, though. The Tour of Italy one year, we had a 65K individual time trial or something. It was grim. It's in rain, hour and a half. And I was just using it as a recovery day, for lack of a better word. And I just I stuck my iPod in there and had my headphones on, listened to some music. But I don't think you're supposed to do that. But pulled it off, still here, <laughs> finished the race. Yeah, is, are there any good go-to cycling songs that I that I'm missing? Like obviously, "Bicycle" by Queen. Um, <laughs> it's the only one I can think of currently. Yeah. It depends yeah. on the mood. I mean, I, I go for like if I have a, I have a list of um, warm-up playlists, depending on you know for time trials or whatever, try and get me in the mood. And, and they're complete different genres. And it, I go through and I, I I play a song from each one and feel which one like which one sort of I make a connection with on that day. And it turns out the ones that um, actually get me fired up it's not, it's not techno it's not metallica it's none of that it's, it's something like a meatloaf or a or a, you know it's something like a celine dion you know like a it's something celine that we're dion. you know oh, just well, hold, hold, hold. i was with you on meatloaf but <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to explain celine sorry you crossed the, line, the titanic yeah. theme what are you doing <laughs> yeah titanic theme potentially 
Just something a little bit emotional. That's real Nick- motivating, eh? Titanic. Yeah, well, okay, Nick Cave, there you go. Something just real Nick sad. Nick Cave, motivating. Just real sad. And you just try and, you know, you almost want to cry before you get on the bike. You're going out the bike and you're just tears thinking about your ex or something and you just find it <laughs> off and you find something special, you know? <laughs> yeah, we all miss your ex. She was great. Um, but I think, like, the thing is, is that um, even when I'm listening, I, I go for. Um, uh, comedy podcasts like I listen to Comedy Bang Bang, which is quite a good one with Scott Aukerman. I don't know if people know who he is, but I recommend it. But you look like a complete goon, smiling and laughing as you're <laughs> cycling past people. That you do look like a total creep when you do that. Yeah, for me, I'm, I'm the, just oh, sorry, Tim. I'm a, I'm to the podcast as well. Actually, normally I, I I'm always onto that those couple of those wounders, Matt and Jerry. You always show your face on or your voice on there every now and again, James. Mm-hmm. But I'm yeah, punch through that most mornings for the first hour, gets me out to the hills, and then when I crack into the hard stuff, I always put some tunes on. Certainly no. not Celine Dion though. Oh, yeah. No, you need to try. No, exactly. burn. Um. Anyway, uh, topic. yeah, topics. So how are we getting with those? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, Who's right. got them? anyone got them written down? No, <laughs> no I got them. I got them. Hey, All James, right. I've actually met you before. You probably don't remember, but I met you at the Beijing Olympics in 2008. We we just won the bronze in the team pursuit, and then we did an interview with you outside the village. You made us do some punishing run through on the footpath there, like yep. depending where we're on the track. And then I think I actually pissed off on a unicycle. I don't know if you remember that. I do remember that very well, actually. <laughs> that was uh, one of my my favourite interviews because we had to we didn't have the the broadcast rights, so we're always outside the stadium unless we had tickets and could go in to watch. So I actually never never saw you uh, win your bronze. But I did um, yeah, get you on that footpath. I remember every single story I did had the, the pedestrian crossing basically yeah. <laughs> going beep, beep, beep in the background. And um, But just by hanging out there, like stalking, um, I, I saw I got a word with Kobe Bryant, saw LeBron, oh, nice. you know. It was actually, there's a lot going on. Yeah, I bet. Well, that was the main, like, in and out of the village, really, for most athletes. That was where the taxi stand was anyway. So if you were there at five in the morning, you would have bumped into some people. <laughs> oh, I know. And that's the thing. You always feel sorry for the athletes who have got an event on the last day. I'm not oh. sure how you guys were placed. It was quite early on, wasn't it? Yeah, we were early. I remember we were, I think we raced after about a week. So there was still two weeks of a um, bit of a bender afterwards. And I remember the marathon runners. We, were like, <laughs> we rolled into the village about eight o'clock in the morning. And the whole village changed across the course of the of the Olympics. You know, obviously the first week, everyone's serious and everyone's in the village eating salads and eating carbs and whatever getting early nights then as it goes on the the food hall starts to slowly switch and you start to see the people who have competed and the food hall gets emptier and emptier during the day and gets busier and busier at seven in the morning or six in the morning when people roll back in and i remember the last the last events the marathon always and the the food hall was chocker at seven in the morning with people throwing chicken nuggets at each other and bloody Try not, to, try not to vomit in the food hall, and then you got you got uh, these little marathon runners who are smaller than George trying to eat their pre-race meal. I felt sorry for them, mate. Eh? Fuel's chucking a chicken nugget at his head. I'm <laughs> asking James if he remembers it. I'm surprised you bloody remember it. Made in James. Yeah. Well, I no, I do. I do remember you, mate. Of course, I remember you. Like, you know, I remember I'm every medalist. Like Sam remembers meeting you. Well, state yeah, that's right. He Sorry, yeah. He no, was, no, no, yeah. no, not that you're not memorable. It's just the state the state he was in for two weeks after his. <laughs> After I, the suit. Oh, I remember I thought, leaving the Olympics with chill blains on my hands. I was that. A lot of people bought, not a lot of people bought unicycles, but a lot of people bought those fold up bikes, you know, that yeah. seemed to be the main uh, purchase in China. Um, but the one person I felt the sorriest for was the swimmer who got hung out to dry. There were some incriminating photos of him looking pretty drunk on a toilet. Um, and is it? Uh, oh, oh yeah. Tried to fight someone. I know that a, was London at a gas station. Who was the guy that tried to fight someone at a gas station? Or that was Ryan again? Lochte. Ryan Lochte, yeah. and uh, I'm talking London. about a Kiwi swimmer. Is, is his name Bell? Was it Daniel? Bell oh yeah, Bell. Yeah, Daniel Bell. He got sent home, I think. What? Yeah. But I don't know. It just it just seemed unfortunate because you know there's yeah. so much going on. Do we have to pick yeah. on one young guy who's just sort of found himself in a? in a compromising situation and so suddenly he becomes this massive scapegoat meanwhile the village is absolute carnage the everywhere state, else. Yeah. and like that's the thing like there's there's nothing wrong with partying there's like there's nothing wrong with that mm. whether you're an athlete or not and the olympic games is the biggest sport event in the world it's also the biggest party to be fair and like there's nothing wrong with that why can't we party we've we've just prepared massively for this 
event that comes around every four years. And when you finish, you want to go out and party. So you do. But unfortunately, there's just so much scrutiny on those athletes. There's so much media around. Obviously, you have the good sports media people that are actually interested in the sports. But then you've got like those tabloid people like, I don't know, TMZ or whatever. Rio was running a different vibe though, you know, because Rio, there was, there was you know, you, did you, you, James, you didn't come to Rio, did you? Yeah, I was there, but I didn't see, uh, was I at the cycling? I can't remember. It was very, I was over by the rowing near Ipanema. Oh, it was pretty nice. Oh, see, okay, yeah. yeah. You got, you were in a good spot there. So we were, yeah. we were bang in the heart of it. And it was actually quite weird though, because there was so much hype about like, um, they were talking about, you know, how the media just said it all about the, the how dangerous it was, and you know, everyone was getting mugged. Anyone that watched a sporting mm. event would get mugged, and so just no one showed up. And then we were so paranoid that we just, you know, we finished up, and I ended up on a medical watch because I was so dehydrated and couldn't move. That, and then, and then when it was just time to, we we didn't have the party vibe at all in Rio. I'm like, which you think was strange because Rio would be the the city you'd you'd typically think to go and party in, but um, the media, well, not the media, but the the paranoia sort of just kind of was a real sort of de-shrinker on that one. You, you, also, yeah. had no te- you also had no teammates there, George. Yeah, you that's true. Solo. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'll straighten up my, I'm getting, I'm getting myself lined up now. I've just worked it out. But, um, so, uh, well, look, you know, if you we we were the same. I, I think I got something stolen, like a raincoat or whatever. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I didn't get mugged. <laughs> uh, I went to a um, uh, what do you call it? Like a favela on the on the last day, and you know we were sort of escorted up there and shown around. Then there there are ways of sort of getting around Rio, but I do think the scaremongering was massive. If it mm. wasn't um, that, it was Zika virus. There was so much um, mm. oh, Zika, you know, yeah. stuff. And even the water as well. They said everyone was going to basically get sick from being in the water, near the water. Um, mm. you know. Uh, so there's like the old, uh, always have admiration for, is it the open water, open water swimming oh, and yep. the triathletes and stuff because they swam on undeterred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would have been a horrible way. Eh? But it uh, said there was a mountain biker that um, our mountain biker Sam Gaze, he uh, walked straight into our accommodation, and I think he brushed his teeth with the with the water, and he ended up. Uh, just get, he did actually get really sick. But we were in these, you know, they knocked up the village, and they, it was it was. Um, I mean, shit, I'm not going to complain about the state of the village. I thought it was pretty awesome compared to what ninety nine point nine percent. That was another whole thing about that Olympics. It was quite weird. You know, you're looking across at a favela, and you're sitting in. A, you know, place that would house whole families and they're just going to, you know, no one could afford it. But, um, yeah. Such a humanitarian. Yeah, I know. But I just, such a humanitarian, George. I know, but Love. I did feel, I, I felt bad about it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so he brushed his teeth with the water and he did actually get sick. So I was like, oh, maybe I should use bottled water. I don't know. Speak. Yeah, that, that's a, that, if it's a reflex action um, by Sam, then you can kind of you can't blame him because sometimes you just wake up and you just do what you normally yeah, do, exactly. right? Well, they also um, need to tape over that. You need to tape over the um, taps. The tap, you know? Yeah, I think so to stop you just from getting complacent. But Kiwis are the are the worst or best if you put it this way, where they'll they'll listen to the advice and they'll take it so seriously for forty eight hours and then they just let it all hang out and this uh, sort of like. <laughs> Going to all the worst places. I remember even in um, Johannesburg for the 2010 World Cup, our our Garmin uh, GPS took us to all the dodgiest neighbourhoods. That if you went online and said where should you not go, it was like do not go there. And we were going through there the whole time. And uh, one of the rules in South Africa is at night you're allowed to run the red lights because uh, because of carjacking. Yeah, yeah. So I love that rule. Um, and uh, and so we just kept the kept our momentum and. You know, got home every night. There's a there's a thing in cycling um, by this this kid I I used to ride with. He's actually in jail now, so I don't know if this is good advice. But he used to run red lights, and as long as he yelled out "bulletproof" as he came up to the intersection, he's, <laughs> he packed himself to get through. Was oh, he bulletproof in jail? How's he going like, with that? How's he going with that catchphrase in jail? I don't know. I haven't asked him. <laughs> he's stuck in Perth. <laughs> um. So, James, mate, so you guys have you've obviously moved into level three now, um, but it's still been a long lockdown for you guys. The main issue, I guess, for you or for a lot of people is, well, not the main issue, but it's certainly an issue, is there's no live sport on. How, how are you coping with that? Because I, I really believe that people are starting to think 
starting to, to realize how much they actually need sport and how much they miss sport and they might not have known really realized that before yeah, I mean, the punters are obviously struggling, but even some of the athletes, I had a, a text, I think, from Scott Barrett, who was just going, oh, they, you know, they need to get some footy started soon. <laughs> and so he's just, uh, he's in Christchurch with the Crusaders. So you can tell that they're, they're all just waiting for um, for the green light. And um, for, I mean, you, you just adjust your life, don't you? Like Normally, my uh, viewing habits over the weekend pretty much revolve around sport. So I've, I've uh, learned to... Uh, watch a lot of um, binge watching nice little Australian sitcoms like Rosehaven, which I recommend. Nice, it just take, it's 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 yeah. escapism. Yeah, it's like a it's got a quirky comedian in there yeah. called Celia. She's an Aussie and uh, she's great. And um and her sort of writing partner. So so that, that's the whole thing. What I what I'd almost do, even though I still go down a YouTube rabbit hole sometimes watching greatest goals or some sort of you know classic catches or something. Um, it's not enough. So you, I almost do that thing where I just go forget about sport. It was only probably three days ago when I decided, okay, I'm going to watch the Michael Jordan uh, documentary, mm. The Last Dance. And I guess you guys might have had a peek mm. at that too. Yeah. yeah. I I went down a rabbit hole the other day or a few weeks ago watching uh, Brian Lara's 400. Yeah. <laughs> just about watched the whole innings. <laughs> Got me well, through a couple of days. And last Saturday, we, re- we we both revisited Game of the Century, um, All Blacks Australia. Let yeah. it go. Yeah, uh, Lomu. Oh, oh no, oh. That's, that's the wrong one. It's, uh, will he get there? You betcha. Yeah, you yeah, betcha. yeah, you betcha. Who was that, Grant Nisbet or Mixed or something? Nisbo. Yeah. Tane that's Randall it. with the sort of basketball pass over to Jonah, and it was Larkin was chasing him down. You'd think he's got wheels, mm. but Jonah next level, eh? He's just yeah. uh, amazing. So, um, um, yeah, we, we actually, um, I mean, we sort of have in some ways sport. Um, we're doing, I've already, I've actually been doing a few online races. So is Sam, uh, like where you, we have a thing. So you have a home trainer and you, it has a power meter in it. And then you, you have a, a computer program, you put your weight into it and um, you just race people. You go online, there's these set races and it's it's e racing. It's e-sport essentially. But it's I mean it's it sucks, but it's it's like we're having sort of team competitions and there's been the whole e gero that was on last week and um yeah, there's quite a few guys and they're proposing that we have a an e sport or an e tour de France and things like that if it if it can't go ahead. Um and I'm looking at other other sports they're doing, like like the the Phoenix are playing FIFA or the A League are doing a FIFA competition, and F1 they're doing, you know, they're having all simulations and stuff. Um, out of all of them, I think cycling has the the most an enjoyable one. It's sort of not much of the gaming aspect and all of the, the suffering aspect. But um, do you think esport is, you know, how how far does esport go in in sort of like satiating people's desire for sport? Um, I think you could probably throw a bit of a celebrity element to it. You know how they've done that with Scotty McLaughlin and all those, yep. um, the sort of top uh, drivers, you know, you know, and um, everyone else called Scott. I think, you know, <laughs> if you can see somebody who is well-known playing FIFA, you'd watch it, you know. You'd have a little bit of interest, like LeBron playing NBA, mm, NBA 2K. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I reckon that in the end, it probably is. You guys are in that sort of position. Like you say, you're the ones that have got the proper suffering. You'd have to really test the um, the resistance, though, wouldn't you? Like, would people be trying to sort of tw- tweak it down? How oh, do they no, control that? Chronic cheating. Chronic cheating. So I did I did the um, – I, I, I was – well, admit, I was quite hungover, but I still did the, the, the first stage of the E-Swiss race, and it was on this platform. And I um, – I did, it was an hour 10 or something, and I, I know my numbers, so I have my power meter, t- and I know what I can do for an hour normally, like a good baseline. And I put out some pretty good numbers for an hour and lost 12 minutes to, I was nearly last, so I was in a fight for my life not to come last, I just didn't want to be that guy, you know, like I didn't want people to think, oh, he's just going and taking the person and he hasn't even tried. So I was fighting my life not to come last, and then I got to the finish, realized I'd lost like eight or 12 minutes, and the only way that's possible if, is if someone's, I think everyone just lies about their weight. That's the easy thing. You just say you're forty. Yeah, kilos. but you, you couldn't do it on that system. Yeah, I think I don't think no. I think you just you just didn't have the ability, unfortunately, on that stage. <laughs> but the, the the um I don't think on that system you could do it, but it's definitely happening. Like on the on the Zwift system, which is um 
the biggest online system for cycling. Um, it has like, I think that some, some days they have hundreds of thousands of people on there at a time. But then you get the, there's so many of them are like um, recreational bike riders, but they want to win these whiff races because it's just like people get, they get sunken into the, sucked into the world. It's like, it's a, that's quite bizarre actually. Sometimes I sort of get sucked in there and I think like I'm on a, on a game and all of a sudden you do get competitive with some guy in a, who's living in the States who you've never met before and you never will, um, probably a lawyer or who knows what, you know. And those people also get that competitive aspect and they're 100% they're changing their weights and stuff like that. But are they the yeah. worst people in the world? The people that cheat at esports? Like cheating oh, at yeah. one sport, like cheating at, like cheating in cycling, like let's say people taking drugs, whatever. I mean, I think you're up there with, with the worst people in the world, but you, there's at least, I mean, I can understand some guy that's come come through, you know, he's got nothing and he's got nothing to lose. Maybe he's born in, in some Eastern European country, he's fighting, you know, and then he goes, well, I can make a million dollars a year if I don't get, if I do this and don't get caught, you run the gauntlet. But like eSport, what are you going to win? No one even knows you, you're just an avatar. You and you're still re- cheating. You've got a real <laughs> extreme, extreme line of who you rate as the worst people in the world. Like you went from having that guy as the worst person in the world to almost justifying it. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> is there a guy in Texas who sort of uh, signs in as 35 kgs and stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're right. you, you see it. like you And like George says, you, you know the numbers you can do and you know that in theory they're in the top percentage of bike riders in the world if you're a professional bike rider and you see these guys and you're like, they're actually punishing you. Like there's no chance. There's no way. Hey, do you know who's on there that um, I've been talking to lately? He's, he's, I've just got him signed up. It's Conrad Smith. He's told me uh, two days ago he was – He's doing some <coughs> online races. He's got into it in a big way, and his brothers um, is is for years was one of the Nathan was one of the uh, New Zealand Olympic uh, Paralympic cyclists, and uh, so he's got Conrad into into riding, and he comes and, and watches the tour and the welter and stuff. And he he was said he was he was stuck in a race with a couple of Frenchies, and he had them on the flat. But I think the um, the years of lifting weights caught up with him. He reckoned on the hill, and he got spat out the ass. So it's, it's, it's surprising who you meet on Zwift. Um, might be something for you, James, if if lockdown continues in a big way. I know. I think, I mean, we're allowed to sort of go a little bit further. And I know cyclists have sort of like kept on. I've had mates who have really enjoyed the whole ghost town uh, appeal of Auckland downtown. And there mm. are, as you know, Auckland downtown's got some good hills there. But mm. I, um, I, I know Conrad did the uh, round Mount Taranaki, which is about 150Ks. Mm. a big and, crash. Oh, really? Oh, last last year, um, or his brother, his was it with his father? He did it, I think. Or yeah. this year, he got round all right. But I think last year he had a big, big, big bingle. Or he was one of yeah. his brother did, or someone did in his in his crew. And um, I think it got a bit messy there. But yeah, this year he was he was round the mountain. I think he might have got round pretty okay. So I, I did about 20 Ks just I was supporting a disabled athlete, athlete called um, Anton Bessling and he um, he's a great great kid uh, and he's you know his his goal is to be in the in the Paralympics one day as well but um, the 20 Ks I did was sort of near sort of Mount Taranaki just near Stratford and you oh, head down all the way downhill to State Highway 3 and you hop on um, State Highway 3 and seriously it's the running of the Bogans. It's, I've never had it, so much abuse uh, from an organized in an organized race where it's pretty clear it's an organized race. Everyone's got mm-hmm. numbers on, and there's a there's a few sort of you know there's people clapping and a couple of marshals, and every single sort of lowered car would come back and without fail yell shit out the window. Yeah. It's like, well, and if they the didn't, you're going, "What's wrong? Come on, at least a little yeah, bit." Yeah. Of abuse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the main road between Wong and Ui and New Plymouth, so. It's yeah. probably not probably full of those. That that opens a whole can of worms about um riding in New Zealand. And I mean we we I've lived over in Europe since I, I moved when I was eighteen. So I lived over the side of the world since then. But I go I come home every year for Christmas and, and a bit of riding before the nationals. And you'd never I, there's two things that, that strike me about New Zealand and, and riding a bike there is one is um the the drivers are absolutely terrible. Um and, and you've where you're bound to have encounters every summer, but on the same, you know, different side of the same coin as the cyclists, there's a lot of cyclists that don't help themselves, and it just becomes this crazy cycle where you get these cyclists, and I, I hate seeing this as much as any bogan car driver because I know it's going to come back to me next time I'm out riding. You see them out, 
you know, sort of two, three abreast on big roads, not not considering, not letting anyone through. And you see them misbehaving, and I get real wound up about that because the next time I go out, stick, you know, stand in my lane, doing, but being as courteous as I can, um, I just cop it. Like I'm doing nothing. And I'm just, yeah. someone's angry. Someone's pissed off from a bunch ride they saw three weeks ago. And they go, oh, you're, you're wearing, you're riding the same, you're on the same mode of transport as those dickheads that were, that held me up. That's and, it. you know, and you get a McDonald's Sunday through your front spoke and you know it is, it is yeah, at least go quick. a bit higher so you can catch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly cool. get something to eat well i guess that you were just talking about esports there that's probably answers this next question anyway which is the state of sport that's the state of sport at the moment <laughs> it's electronic it's e um yeah. so I, I guess now like as as the world starts to slowly well places in the world start to slowly come out of this lockdown and start to progress forward um and then certainly down the track at some point. I know in Australia they're talking about the NRL being been on in just a few weeks' time. Um, cycling's certainly a little bit longer longer behind that. But I guess it's like, how is sport going to come out of this? How is this going to survive? What's the recovery of sport going to be after this this hiatus? I mean, obviously you've got, a, you've got stadium sports, which surely are, going to, are not going to be able to have full stadiums for months to come. You know, they, they might be playing those sports behind closed doors. And then you've got open air sports such as cycling, which is free to go to. Um, you can go to anywhere on the side of the road for 200 kilometres and watch bike riders. And you can't really police that. Um, and you can't police how big the crowds are. So it's going to be really interesting to see how these sports do come out of it and how they try to to continue to exist, but following the certain set of guidelines. Yeah, it's um, like it, it's, <coughs> it's, 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 everything's up in the air. Even the NRL where they've said, Okay, it's happening May 28th in Australia. But they, I mean, they're slowly getting permission to do all these different things, but they just basically said, we're doing it. And, um, and you know, Warriors had to come over. And everybody, you know, so they were the most gung-ho about it. They basically said, we're, you know, we're going to, we're finding a place to, to host the NRL. We don't care where it is. It could be Wuhan. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna freaking do this. We're Australian, mate. Yeah. And so if they um if they they're gonna be a big litmus test, I reckon. If they can mm. do it with social distancing in stadiums, for example. I mean, I know they're probably gonna be empty stadiums, but let's just wait and see. You know, um, oh. there's a lot of sta- big stadiums here, for example, in a uh, in a season where you could have people two meters apart, and um, just in the same way when you're at the supermarket, and if the if um, you know the COVID rates are really low, then why not? But it's more the financial side of things. You think about how much it's it's hit business and um, and how much money everybody's going to lose and how much money people don't have to spend. Right. We don't really know until we maybe come out into level two or level one. But um, just that sort of uh, uh, the shadow, the echo of all this um, of the lockdown is going to be massive uh, for sport. So. If they can still have get a product out there, New Zealand's in a in a position of luxury, isn't it? Like we, the COVID rates are low, we could have a competition. Um, say for example, it's Super Rugby derbies. Well, people around the world will will buy that, won't mm. they? They'll watch that. So at least mm. it's they're going to have a product they can sell, and they can work out if if it's if they can make money and survive again. But New yeah, Zealand, that- um, I mean, sorry, cycling and. and- Cycling's got a business model that's quite different to that, and it's it's been a terrible business model that's probably kicked us in the ass for the last fifty years. Whereas, unlike we don't have any TV rights, we don't have any ticket sales. Um, we just rely on essentially, I mean, not charity because the the sponsors get something back, but we just have big sponsors. They they give you a budget. Each team might be somewhere between twenty to forty million euros a year in their budget, and then you get the money, and they say do what you can with this. And essentially we work in advertising and um, there's no yeah. revenue generated. Yeah. Well, so, that's the, like, yeah. the difference between like cycling and a lot of those big sports is certainly the, the revenue, because if you look at uh, sports right now and how they're suffering, not being able to be, be competed, there's cycling is suffering in only really one way. We can't promote our, our sponsors, but the, we're not, we haven't lost any income because we didn't have any to start with. But then you get you have teams like uh, sports like yeah football or um, NBA or NFL or whatever who have these massive TV rights that the teams sell to the to the companies. They have merchandise sales, they have the ticket sales, and all of those teams as individual teams are beneficiaries of those of that income. Whereas in cycling, we're not. 
So even though, so those sports might be suffering more than cycling at the moment because they haven't got any income that they would normally rely on. But once sport does resume, they're going to have an income stream again, whereas cycling is going to come out of this and still be in the same exact same position. And all we've done is have sponsors and companies hemorrhage money through a crisis. Mm. And then they, they go, fuck, now we can't afford cycling team because there's no income. Yeah, it's weird because you could, like, I mean, I guess you do get money, don't you, from Tour de France? Um, no. Well, I mean, someone does from, I mean, yeah, sorry, no, the, ASO, you know, the ASO, so the, 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 the yeah. owner of the Tour de France, they yeah. they have cycling by the balls completely. That's and, it. And they just get all the TV rights and um, all the all the image rights, everything from them. So they're, they're growing massive out of this and they're becoming potentially i mean aso they they were the biggest sporting i think they also own um do they do part of the, the tennis as well in france the amory sporting organization but uh, i'm not sure all oh, right but they um so they grow massive and they they strive on keeping we have basically have to keep everyone else in there then for them to, to to stay on top they they need everyone to stay in their lane a little bit and, and try and sort of suppress any uprising so i think it's almost the time for cycling to to stage the coup and say if there is a tour de france i mean maybe not this year because of of, of how vulnerable things are but the the ingredients are there or the the environment is now created that things have gotten so desperate that we need to say either share your tv rights and your image rights with the teams or we don't come but the problem is there's always a team that's willing to say well if you guys don't come we'll go because you know french small teams that it's, it's worth so much to their sponsors and then if half the teams don't go, there'll still be a bunch of other teams that go and maybe some random guy wins the Tour de France and, you know, it's still on his Palmares for the rest of his life. Yeah, and, and, we, and we have sponsors to protect. Like, if we don't yeah. the, like our sponsors, are, 85% of their advertising comes from Tour de France. If we go, oh, hey, guess what, guys? We're not going to go <laughs> this year. <laughs> They'll be like, oh, no, you're no. going to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's, that's the problem, isn't it? You know, that massive catch-22 of them having the biggest brand, the biggest event. Um, all the history, because it's quite hard to start something up that's got that, you know. Um, mm. but there, there, are, there, there's, there are, there is evidence of sports events having prestige um, in a in a short amount of time, and you've just really got to have all the best people there. So yeah. whether it's um, whether it's somewhere in, in America or or wherever, you know, could Australia do it? TA, I mean, mate. Look, yeah. what a great place. I mean, that's where I did most of my cycling with uh, the Waipas uh, uh, Cycling Club pooning yeah. past me because I used to be on a, a thing called a grifter, which is an early mountain bike. And um, yeah, a I grifter. do remember grifter. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Out of, uh, it's uh, yeah, I'm pretty old school, mate. Um, hey, did but, you ever do the Witches Circuit? Did you ever? I mean, when I, I used to go to Taumudu for the TA Junior Tour, and I used to, I got put up with, you know, the Livingstons, the, the big. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he was the mayor. Uh, probably he was, he was he'd run the show up in PA when I was there. Yeah, um, wasn't the mayor, but building a lot of houses. And uh, there was there was always a we, we used to do this race in TA and it was on called the Witches Circuit. And I always wondered why it was called the Witches Circuit. And then Mate, I've never explained. I, I, I raced every single race as a junior in TA, T- Moody basically. Come from Rotorua, that was we had no we had no racing, so I always went over to the Waikato. And yeah. when you mentioned the Witches Circuit to me the other day, GB. I'd never heard it. What are you and talking you about? Came, you came to TA once a year. Yeah, I came, I came here twice in my life. I loved it. <laughs> but there was a witch up. I can't remember what side of town it was on, but just out of town, there was a lady that lived in the Tarpaulin tent. Do you, is this one? Was Parangia. Was Parangia, maybe. The witch of Te Aumutu. I'm trying to, trying to think. There's so many candidates for that. I, um, I'm not she would quite... just come out and, and throw You need to narrow it down more to uh, a woman living in a tarpaulin. Um, <laughs> there's a few of those of, going like, on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, like, okay. I can't. There's so many. But Which yeah. woman living in a tarpaulin tent that throws oranges? Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I remember the best, the, my, my biggest memory of the um, of Te Aumuru. I used to go there just about every weekend to stay with a couple of mates. Was the Hump Bridge. Remember the Hump Bridge? I think it was like towards Parongia or something. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, it's, uh, it, yeah the, hump, uh, the Humpty Dumpty Bridge, which gives you, if you go over it in a car, yeah. it makes you feel um, oh. funny things in your nuts. And there's all, the, <laughs> there's all those grooves. Like, everyone used to jump your car. I think we we jumped um, our friend's dad's old BMW one one day. We got off the ground. Yeah. It was pretty freaky. Right, but... One of the great bridges, but un, <laughs> yeah. an unsung hero of a bridge because everyone's going, oh, Golden Gate, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. what, that doesn't give you that feeling, you know, no, exactly. when you go over it. 
take your 20 yeah. minutes to go over that thing. You want that couple of seconds over that hump bridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just out near Mount Kakapuku. So that's the that's the um the spot. Pokeru is the area out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, nobody will know where these places are <laughs> as we uh, as we delve into the geography of uh, the Tiamidu area. Um, are we going to talk about Rushley Buchanan or any of the great Tiamidu cyclists? Or that was the that was the BMW we jumped. Rushley Buchanan's old man's beam. I hope he doesn't watch this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely trashing the beamer out there. But um, I mean, these are important things, though. Eh? Like, could you bring back? I I was wondering where the cycling could come back early because of the social distancing obviously you've got people those lunatics on the on the side of the road they'd have to piss off mm. but um, but i guess if all the athletes are pretty happy that nobody's got covid you could go hammer and tongs and and still have that um you know you don't necessarily do you need the crowds all the time um, i mean it, it adds something but the thing yeah. is if, i'm i i disagree with a lot of what so the, the Tour de France has come out and said, we're not going to hold it behind closed doors, you know, with no crowds. We're not going to hold the race without that. And I disagree because I think, like, people are so hungry for sport. I mean, sure, the, it won't be as good, but nothing's going to be as good this year. Nothing you do is going to be good in the, in the you know, as, as it was. So, like, why not give people something to watch? And, yeah, and like, it's, like the Tour de France, for example, going back to that, it's, most of its viewers are global viewers that are watching it on TV. Mm. Sure, there's a couple of million people there on the side of the road, and sure, it creates an awesome atmosphere for the spectators and the bike riders. Um, but ultimately, like, the, the spectators, I'd rather no, not have spectators and have a sport and have a yeah. race. And if, I don't know how they do that, but I'm sure they can police it somehow. Um, yeah. And if, it'd actually be safer as well for us sometimes, you know, like going up those climbs when you've got like a million people on a 10k stretch of road and you've seen a couple of crashes or no, oh, I think drunk fans or whatever, or a few punch-ons or whatever. But um, it, it's it's not worth it's not worth missing the missing the race and missing the sport so that the fans can be there. Let's yeah, well, it seems. I mean, I guess what, what, what I, I saw, even though yeah, having the fans is awesome, ringing cowbells and dressed as the devil and all that. But um, there's obviously a bit of at least uh, atmosphere or whatever generated by the peloton or you know just mm. the mm. the job because I mean that's that's kind of when you look at, um, say, for example, when the NRL played, those league games were just bizarre, weren't they? Whereas you oh, can kind of, if you're going along, as well. what's that? The, the, oh, cricket. the cricket, the cricket, oh, yeah. Geez. And Jimmy Jimmy Neesham, I was talking to him the other night, and he said that it was he felt more pressure because he just knew that the camera was yeah. only looking at him. Yeah, yeah. Not searching for hotties in the crowd or someone spilling his beer or whatever. They're all like <laughs> on Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. So he found it like quite tough, unnerving, um, in in that environment. But I guess it's the, that's what we're going to get used to. Um, I mean, there's so many changes that we're going to see in sport. I, I always look at sport, and I I do feel for for you guys who work that hard, and um, and a lot of Olympians as well. You know, like Mahe Drysdale, who's probably say one of the uh, our, one of the, the great modern Olympians, and he would hmm. earn less. Um, uh, for his sport than most of the people in the front office at rowing New Zealand. You know, it's just yeah. that thing that uh, when you're on the coalface for the, a lot of those, um, uh, you can call them minority sports or whatever you want to say, you know, they're not, not massive spectator sports. The The money's not there. So what's going to happen now with the economy or the recession mm. that's going to follow? Mm. Yeah, a lot of them rely I, on sponsorship and, a lot, and, 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 you know, sort of you know, local, I mean, if the, yeah. if the government's having to cop out to keep businesses afloat, I imagine a few sports grants are going to go, you know, go yeah, away as well. Sure. But then, yeah, yeah, that's true. But the, New Zealand's a sporting nation, so they're, they're going to do the government's going to do their best, I reckon, to keep sport alive in whatever sense they can. Um, and then just sport is like we spoke about at the start of this. Like sport is such a a big thing in people's lives, and I don't think a lot of people realise that until this happened. Until they couldn't watch sport. I mean, mm. you might you might not watch sport on. The, you might there might be a rugby game on on Saturday, and you might choose not to watch it. But you always had that option. Now you don't have that option. People are mm. actually starting to realise. Shit, I actually do want to watch the rugby or whatever. I do want to watch the cycling. I do want to watch the cricket or the rowing or whatever. And sure, if there's going to be a recession come out of this, but there's going to be some people who will come out of it okay or better than others. And sport is going to be one of the first things that happens on TV globally that unite countries again gets the people passionate about what they're watching. And it could actually be a really good opportunity for some companies that do come out of this okay to then get some exposure and, and get 
you know, recovery re- to, to recover through exposure through sport. Well, I mean, you look at my industry, the media, that's basically been like bloody Jurassic Park, you know, with um, we're like extras in Jurassic Park with the T Rex <laughs> just coming picking off or everybody, you know, and you're just that's waiting it. to see what who's next. Mm. And I've had heaps of mates who've lost work and lost jobs, and um, and they're all what you'd say uh, they're at the coalface, you know. They're, yeah, they're I've been talking to the Radio and... Sport boys quite a bit, and um, exactly. Ruben and, and those boys, and and man, it's it's and Brian seeing what they, those guys have, have gone through, losing losing that. I mean that yeah. that's been a staple for me. I mean, how often is radio? I mean, before before actually ACC was commentating cricket, I was listening to Radio Sport if I was out doing something, you know, if I wasn't able to have a have a, a day and five days in front of the tv i'd listen to radio sport and now that's yeah well those know. things well those stations like radio sport and stuff come back do you think james when sport commences um or- i reckon they, they should be able to but they're just going to have to change the entire business model i mean there's a lot of um sponsors who would be loyal to radio sport if it if it uh you know sort of rose from the ashes but the problem is do those sponsors have uh, money anymore are they a business yeah. anymore so yeah. you just have to wait and so, i mean i think that what it's shown because all my mates have lost work um work for those big media companies and and it just shows that there's no safety in those numbers of being in a big company um it should probably hopefully see smaller companies uh take flight and um and where you know that that content is king i mean they are content NZ Me and Bauer are content creation companies, right? So yeah. Bauer was the magazine company. So, um, you know, the content, cre- say, for example, in NZ Me, the content creators, that they, they, I always feel like the journalists, and I'm probably biased because I am one, um, should be the, they should be on the, the last people to go because mm. without them, you don't have the content, oh, right? Exactly. So, so with you guys in sport as well, if you look at me as a sports journalist, I'm I'm a, um, a further step back from where you are, where literally without you guys, there's nothing to report. So this is the whole thing is like they, uh, it may change how people feel about what the priority is, you know? So mm. it's like, I always feel with contact sport, for example, rugby and league, that they, you know, people will complain that they played quite well here, but it's like, well, they're the ones who are risking everything and, you know, uh, serious injuries, same as you in cycling, right? But um, so that they they earn that danger money or whatever. So it's not really, um, uh, and, but you know that without them, there is no sport. You, know, yeah, you, can, that, you could probably survive without the without the general manager and all these other people um, brutally, but without their absolutely. players, there's nothing. You know? <laughs> That's the big argument we've always had in cycling is that we've been, um, yeah, never never been a beneficiary of these TV rights and, and stuff. For example, you know the ASO making hundreds and millions of dollars on the Tour de France, and the team's not seen any of it. But we're we're the actors in the play, and like yeah. that ultimately, like you say, the sport doesn't exist with without the athletes and yeah. and and sport isn't just sport anymore like the way sport is a, such a globally viewed um thing industry it's entertainment as well and like you, you can also argue oh leonardo dicaprio is getting paid 25 million to make that movie because he's entertaining you that's what sports people are doing as well so yeah. it's not just yeah there's the danger money and all that for those like contact sports like rugby players but also like rugby is New Zealand's number one entertainment, effect, effectively, in a sense. So you're totally. paying to watch entertainment. And that's right. You know, Sport is a popularity contest, and that's probably what I wanted to add as well. Yeah, that you're right. In terms of ratings, um, they they earn it because they're the biggest show, and that and it shows, you know, and there's a reason why Lord gets paid the most as a musician in New Zealand because she sells the, the most tickets, you know. There's just – that is a brutal reality of it. So um, – but, yeah, I guess now that we're – now that we've kind of have having to think about what really it takes for a, for a sport to tick, well, you've really got to protect the um, the athletes and make sure that they're they're going to be okay. I mean, every single athlete that was um, preparing for Tokyo Olympics um, has had to put things on hold. I mean, Mahe is going to be another year older, so he'll be like sixty or something, and um, <laughs> he's like so. The, the, or everybody who's who's uh, you know, and they don't realise that. You know, that's for example, the hockey team. You know, the hockey team, they, they live like students, really. If you play yeah. hockey for New mm. Zealand, you're, you're living like a student. So they're delaying their lives big time, you know, like or whatever their earning potential is. Yeah. And there's a lot of smart cookies who sacrifice, you know, probably 
you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in just a normal sort of uh, wage to play hockey for New Zealand. Yeah. Um, so you and know, then, it puts yeah, it puts it on hold, doesn't it? And then those 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 sports that aren't making um, the athletes aren't making a lot of money, where they're living probably hand to mouth it in a sense. Um, when they come out of this, when they come out, when we come out of this crisis and they start to compete again, they're going to need to be promoted. They're going to need to be effectively jam down people's throats again so people are on board go oh yeah let's watch the hockey let's watch the hockey and who's going to do that if you'd fire all the journalists yeah <laughs> that's right don't <laughs> don't fire the journalists yeah. i mean i'm sure like you know if, if you look at radio sport i i think it was i never trusted the radio ratings it's a book system so who's going to fill out a book you yeah. know it's going to well, I've never, i always wonder that who i've never been asked that i mean okay i don't live in new zealand but when i yeah. when i'm there for three i've never been asked if i'm there for three or four months a year maybe Who's filling out those books? Yeah, and posting enough. them back. I mean, when was the last time you posted anything that yeah. really, you know, you're Is not going to do it. So they send it to you and then you, yeah. what, then you, I didn't even hear it sent to me. Yeah, yeah, you tick, tick the boxes. I, w- I, w- I listen to Radio Sport in this, these hours, then listen to Hodaki, of course, and yeah. then um, and then send it back in. I mean, nobody's doing that. And so that's why I sort of think, like, you know, they're a victim of, the 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 ratings not falling their way and mm. i think it was kind of like a lot of people um you know their, their second favorite station everyone would always tune into radio sport to see what was happening and um now i'm hoping that they can kind of keep the team together and become something in some mm. way but uh it's quite expensive i think to get a radio frequency in new zealand so they need to the government needs to do sort that out and, and uh, to make it accessible so well, they need uh, to get on a boat and sail out into the Hodaki Gulf and broadcast pipe yeah. and pirate radio. That's right. Mm, and um, yeah. well, I mean, ideally, you could do it online, right? Because we're all listening to podcasts, but I just don't think people have got to that level yet. And, you know, when you're in your car, you listen to the radio, don't you? Half the time or in, in mm. the morning, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we went on, um, you know, Jed, Jed Sane, Jedi? Yeah. I don't yeah. Know, yeah. So me and George had on his radio show in Hong Kong the other, the other week. That was a fucking disaster. But anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as you can imagine with Jedi. But yeah, um, yeah, he, yeah. He's, he's doing it online. He's not paying for a radio frequency, I'm sure. No. But no way. No, and he, yeah. you know he's a talented guy. He knows his stuff, yeah. um, Jedi. He, he's, you know, he, he'd have tons of options. But I sort of feel like um, quite often when you, if you approach like the, the big, corporates and the companies sometimes you just don't there's not a fit there's not something that you really want to do like i'm so mm. lucky that crowd goes wild exists mm, because yeah. the mainstream media isn't really my thing so crowd goes wild acc hodaki which are kind of the three media outlets that i do most of my work for i'm just grateful they actually even exist because what else is there that you know i'll be a square peg in a round hole well i'm the round one i guess round <laughs> peg in a square hole <laughs> yeah. so and and you'd have to create your own your own thing and that's what people will be doing um it's a bit of watch this space hopefully we'll get to that point where everybody is quite happy to sort of like stream stuff uh live as they're out and about um you know in your car or whatever yeah and that's yeah. that's i guess how it goes with like radio Haraki is like I mean, we we don't get that over here in Spain, but we still listen to it. So we're streaming it, you know, through yeah. iHeartRadio or heart. the, the podcast, um, the podcast they put out. Mm. And I guess yeah, that's always that can be definitely an avenue for for radio and potentially a cheaper way for at least for the radio sport or or stations like that to start up again, because it's going to be necessary to have that that stuff again for sure. Yeah. Oh well. Um, we've probably taken up enough of your time, James. What's what is it's it, it's uh Friday night in New Zealand, is it? It's Friday night, it's a pretty lonely night, uh, tonight. Oh. Uh, <laughs> suck, suck my, my, to, yeah, to I don't, I don't, want, I, 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 I don't want to complain about anything. Um, you can see, see, I've got a toilet duck behind me, is it quite? It's quite, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, what's he doing there? I've noticed you're the only Kiwi that doesn't have a Tui. Me and Sam have just come to the, the shopping realization that. And our backgrounds, we're both rocking New Zealand's native birds. Um, right. We're so yeah, we're yeah. so patriotic Kiwis, eh? Like you go, yeah. to, like I probably wouldn't have a key, uh, this this on my wall if I was living in Rotorua, but because I'm in Spain, I'm like, oh, I better get a tui on the wall. Yeah, no, get no, a tui. A cup, I've got a, a coffee cup with a kiwi on it and a 
16 per numbers on and you have been running a lot of you really are you miss you miss it so much when you send away at 18 you're like this orphan that's like why did yeah. you send me away <laughs> but the tui is that the, one of the best sounds when you get back home though oh, some yeah. of the native Mate. that's so good yeah, you just know you're good. home well, you know when you get off an auckland dog. airport you're walking through yeah. the duty free and they have the, the tui sounds and stuff at auckland airport there yeah yeah and you're always like oh. with the automated pulpity but then they don't have a they don't have a bakery. You can't buy a pie. It always pisses me off when I land in Auckland Airport because I'm like, oh, I've been overseas for eleven months. I just want to like yeah. step into a min and cheese, and then you can't even you can't get one. You got to wait till you get to over to the domestic terminal. Yeah, and pay, like, bar, they do a good pie. yeah, it's like twelve bucks though. Yeah, yeah so you do forget how important pies are. Every single athlete um, I've spoken to overseas misses the pies big time. Like James Lowe, he was in Ireland. He's just saying. You know they've got pastries, but it's not the same. No, oh, the you know? pasty's not a pie, is it? I, I no. actually had a I, with a with a um, Cumbrian recently. I had a encounter where it got quite heated that he was claiming a, a pasty was essentially just, oh, a, pasty, just a pie. Yeah, no. A pasty, no. sorry. Yeah, that's not that's not good enough, is it? Yeah, I don't know what. Maybe James meant um, pasty because I think they've got those in Ireland as well. But he's mm. saying, "Where's your steak and cheese?" You know, oh, yeah. needs to be ridiculously hot at the start, always blow on the pie, all that sort of <laughs> it, it's a ritual and you're really missing out because you guys actually burn enough calories to to earn pies. Like we're whereas yeah. I wasted on people like me. It's the worst possible freaking thing. I there's actually, the there's actually of, a um, um there's uh, a oh, I was gonna talk about Dos Kiwis. There's a brewery here in, in Spain in Girona, about about thirty K out of Girona. It's called Dos Kiwis. It's a micro brewery. This Kiwi guy started it with a he married a Catalan Catalan bird, and I think he was a hairdresser in, in London for quite a long time. He decided he's going to move down here and open this microbrewery. And they were showing all the world rugby world cup games last year. So all the Kiwi boys were going out there every every weekend or whenever to watch the All Blacks play. And then they ended up getting hold of some pies. They had the I think they came from Barcelona or something. There's a, a cafe down there called Little Fern or Kiwi Fern or something. Yeah, and uh, and we actually had we we got our pie hit. We watched England smash us in the semis. I always got. I lived in Spain for a little while in Madrid, and I got a massive shock. I was supposed to be playing rugby there, actually, and I pulled a hammy and decided to get, get out of town. Who are you playing for? Velo de Lid. Uh, Cal, no, not by Leith, which is one of the big good clubs. Um, I, a, I was uh, playing for. Do you know Matt Cal- Smith playing there now? Oh, really? Yeah, Matt. Yeah, he just made the. He's just made the um, the Spanish national team. I read something about that. Yeah. yeah, that's quite cool. Yeah, um, there was a few Kiwis playing for Spain back then. My mate was coaching Spain, a guy called Bryce Bevan, and oh, yeah. he, um, he, uh, yeah, I, he sort of set me up with this club called Cal Madrid, which is right in the middle of town near the Atletico Madrid um, stadium. It was a, a good spot, and um, and I, I love just mixing with all the all the Spaniards. But I did notice that you know they mainly congregated in bars like you well, they wouldn't invite you back to their place they'd say mm. let's meet at the mm. at the bar and you go there and on the floor in the bar is just toothpicks and shells <laughs> and like fish um you know like they eat the sardines <laughs> and, and, the eggs and stuff yeah and i was yeah. like what's happened has there been some you know like someone there's been a break-in or some kind of like riot and it's like no they just basically that have you never wear your good shoes out in madrid no, that, don't wear your good shoes out. That's the that's the advice. Good advice. That level of hygiene probably didn't help the fact that they were the epicenter of COVID nineteen in Spain. I suppose. No. <laughs> no. Do people drop stuff on the floor? And uh, is Andorra a bit different? Or um, oh, Andorra? No, Andorra's just um, what's well, quite strange now because Andorra's a town built on um, immigrants, essentially, but like me, uh, or migrants. <clears throat> work coming here for work and and there's a lot of ski and stuff now everyone's buggered off because all the tourism's closed it's just a bizarre it's a very bizarre feeling now and yeah i don't know there's not really a, a sort of social scene unlike girona i mean i'm also based in girona half the time as well so um just across the road from sam so down there it's got much more of a sort of uni vibe and a, a bit of a sort of sense of normality but i'm stuck on the top of the mountain and I'm yeah. here for you know altitude, and the only sort of company I have is is yeah my girlfriend that's locked in this this room with me for the last seven weeks. Mate, you're not you're not missing anything down here. No, I think it's, it's universal. Unlike McD- uh, New Zealand, I saw when we went back to level three, New Zealand managed to run about six McDonald's franchises into the ground and about by about half eight in the morning. <laughs> And KFC was the queues are still ridiculous around KFC. Not that I've been sniffing around too much, but um, 
you know, there's always my local Wendy's, uh, uh, the old tried and tested, um, yeah. Big Bacon Classic. Uh, yeah, I, I do remember, like, I was just thinking for you guys now, the weather is probably going to be okay because you're getting up to, I remember they say, said in Madrid, was it, hasta la cuarenta de mayo no te quites el sayo, which means until the 14th of May, yeah. don't forget your raincoat because <laughs> yeah. no, then dressed, after the after they dress the, 14th the calendars. Of May, they yeah. dress the calendars here. I walk around like sometimes in January, it can still be 20 degrees in Girona. So I go to the supermarket. Uh, even the other day, I went to the supermarket in April, 20 something degrees. I went in Jandals in a Michael Jordan singlet, and I just you, they look at you like you've got three heads. Because it's not it's not the calendar summer yet. They just dressed to a calendar. Still got scarves yeah. on. Well, that's first of May. We're gonna have people just kidding down all It's like strip poker throughout the year. They just first yeah. of May they'll lose a layer. Yeah. And that's that's the thing. It's coming up to good times and good weather. Yeah. Um you can't I mean it's it's such a shame like for, for Spain it's got hammered so hard because um it's uh, an awesome country. You guys must um I know that you're in you're in Andorra, but um you must spend a bit of time in Spain mm. as well, George. But for you, Sam, uh, have the the locals welcomed you big time? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it took a while. Um, Girona is quite a funny place. It's, well, when I first moved here, it was very much um, a local local place, but it's become more and more touristy over the years. And a lot Ever of people since speak, Game of Thrones, really. Yeah, Game of Thrones. They filmed oh, here right. and they, they brought the hordes. Um, and a lot of people speak English, but yeah, I, I guess it, I've been here for. I think this is my 11th year here now. Um, so started, yeah, obviously I just had a couple of couple of mates from from home when I first came here, like Hayden Rolston, George came a year year later. And then, um, and then yeah, branched out, Got now got a lot more local friends and like lo- little local bars, stay away from those, you know, from the Irish pub and the Rambler, although- it's been, Don't pretend you stay away from the Irish pub. I've spent a few dollars there oh, in, in my time. I, but- I, I spent a lot of time at Irish pubs, uh, the Irish Rover, which is this is the worst thing. Like I'm a mad um, football fan. I love football, and it was right next door to the Bernabeu Stadium. And I didn't once try to go to a Real Madrid game when I was there. <laughs> that was my dream when I was a kid. But I just went, oh well, I'm at the pub now, yeah. so <laughs> I'll just. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone's yeah, here. We live just uh, down the road from Camp New, I guess. And yeah, we still have, I still haven't been. I've been, been, but I've been. Yeah, they don't serve booze in the stadiums here, though. That's probably that half the reason yeah. people don't come out of the pub. Well, it was really hard to get a ticket. You needed to know someone, but I just thought I, I showed a distinct lack of hustle trying to go to one of the absolute cathedrals of sport. And um, <laughs> even though I was in Madrid for a couple of months and going to a pub that was walking distance, yeah, the Irish Rover. Yeah, oh, oh, just, the Irish pubs, they, they, they do save, these, save us on time to time. Though. But it's good. Now we've got our little local bars um, yeah. here in Girona that we go to and just chew the fat with the Catalans. And then when you want to launch with the boys, you... Maybe you go to the Irish. Yeah, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Um, well, I must come over there for a bike ride sometime, you know, like um, uh, obviously more of a downhill sort of thing, I'd say. Oh, yeah. there's plenty of flat roads around and um, yeah, the Girona flat's a bit, a bit bigger than the, than the Andorra flat that I've just given you a tour of. So plenty of room, mate, if you're ever in more town. Than, more than welcome, mate. Do you reckon Thanks. I'll be able to tuck in behind you and get a, a bit of slipstream from you guys? Who's the You'd widest? Be off behind you? Sam. Not from George. <laughs> I, I think yes, I'm, yes. I'm pretty much, um, there's a lot of reasons you don't want to ride behind me, but that's the main yeah. one. In the bus, like, I always notice people popping off behind me. It'll be like putting yeah. an olive on the end of a toothpick or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Good. Noted. Noted. All right. Well, hey, um, like, we'll have a chat. We'll ca- catch up once this is all over anyway. And yeah. hopefully we'll all the best over there and um, hopefully you're riding soon. Yeah, Thanks, talk mate. about some real sports. Thanks, James. I really appreciate you coming yes. on and giving up your time on a Friday night. No worries. I've got nothing else to do, get, to be honest. Get back to those Zoom meetings or whatever you... Yeah, yeah, whatever Zoom drinks in my life. Zoom drinks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, yeah good, man. Cheers, guys. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Yeah.